We have returned. Hemos regresado. We are back. Visha, General Belgaran. I told you we were going to get into that museum. I wasn't kidding. Look, we may have done Plan B, which was day drinking. We liked Plan B. Plan B was good. It was fun. But uh, we're going we're gonna to do Plan A now on a different day. Different day, but we're back. Visha Hedero Belgrano. And uh, the museum is open. I called ahead. I know now that it is open. And we're going to see it. But before we do, I realized in the last video, I said right at the start, oh, we're going to be here. We're going to talk about the history of German immigration to Argentina because it's like a long and interesting history. And then uh, we didn't do that. We got sidetracked by like all the like fun architecture and the and the Oktoberfest and, and all kinds of other stuff. We got super sidetracked. And we did end up going up to the museum and it was closed. But this time it's going to be open. And we're not going to get sidetracked. I'm telling you, we're not going to get sidetracked this time. So, our two missions are going to be talking about the history, the long and interesting history of German immigration to Argentina and getting inside that museum. Let's go. So Germans have been uh, immigrating to Argentina for like a long time. The history goes way back. There's actually like, I think there's a settlement in, near Buenos Aires in the province somewhere that back, goes back to like the 1820s. So, so quite some time ago. I mean, 1820s, that's like right after Argentina broke away um, and gained independence from Spain. So, like it's, it's quite a long time ago, but a lot of the, uh, the immigration before like 1870 or so, there really wasn't very much. It's just a little bit here, a little bit there. But from, you know, 1870, late 1800s up until like the beginning of World War I, that's when Argentina had the uh, big, big, big European immigration boom. So like they opened up immigration to, to people from all over. And that's where you saw, of course, like we've talked about before, um, immigration like Italian immigrants, lots of them during that time. And also um, lots of uh, like uh, European Jews, specifically from like, um, from uh, Western Europe mostly, in Italy actually. But during that time, you know, before World War I, late 1800s, a lot of German immigrants came as well. And, um, you know, that, that immigration period, like I said, was, was something for Argentina that really, like that really shaped the history of Argentina in that period because the, the reason why there are so many um, people of European descent here in Argentina, Italian descent, German descent, it really comes down to like that period. Um, that's a really important period for immigration here. The thing to note about the German immigration is, you know, Germany wasn't even a country the way we think of it, like a nation state, until 1871. So, you know, a lot of the German immigration pre-1870 was like Germanic immigration. People of German culture spoke German as a language, but, you know, like I said, not actually a, a nation, a country as we would think about it today, until 1871. And, uh, from 1870 to, uh, to 1914, beginning of World War I, that period of like lots of German immigration along with lots of other European immigration to Argentina, a big portion of that was uh, not Germans from Germany itself, but Volga Germans, which they have their, inter their own interesting story. So Volga Germans refers to um, Germans who, before Germany was, uh, was a nation in 1870, back in the 1700s, 1760s, um, Catherine the Great of Russia invited Germans to come and settle in the Volga River Valley, in the sort of like western part of Russia. And uh, a lot of them settled there. Th tens of thousands of them settled there. And the promise that she made was that they would basically get to keep their, uh, you know, their 
culture, their religion, their language, and all of these things. And for about a hundred years, that was true. They were able to keep all of that. Now, there were other groups that uh, immigrated around the same time and were given the same promise. And uh, in the late 1800s, 1870, 1880, around there, uh, a lot of things changed in Russia. There was a period of russification where all these groups that were promised 100 years ago that they were going to be able to keep their culture and their language and whatnot, turns out uh, they weren't. And now the Russian Empire was began to force them to give up that culture, began to uh, pressure them to speak Russian, began to pressure them to convert to the Russian Orthodox Church, and things like this. And of course, this did not go over well with a lot of those groups, specifically Volga Germans. So during that period, 1870, to the beginning of World War I, uh, when, Vol when Russia was you know, cracking down on their culture, at the same time, the United States and Argentina, places in Brazil and places like that were sort of opening up their doors for immigration. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of Volga Germans ended up going to Argentina and settling here. And it's interesting now, there's probably about three and a half million, three and a half million people of German descent here in Argentina, and two and a half million of them descend from Volga Germans not from uh, Germans, you know, from Germany. So the majority of uh, German descendants here in Argentina, they actually descend from Volga Germans. And arguably, well, not really arguably, honestly, I don't know who would be able to argue the other side of this, but the Argenti or the Volga Germans who settled in Argentina ended up in the long run having a much, much better time of it than the Volga Germans that decided to stay in, uh, in Russia. Those Volga Germans over the years between, you know, the late 1800s up until the beginning of World War II, they were subjected to pretty harsh times. Famines, uh, Stalin's great purge of 1937, where a lot of them were either murdered or deported out to the uh, Siberian gulags. Definitely several, several bad decades for the Volga Germans in Russia during that time. Whereas Volga Germans in uh, Argentina were prospering. They were setting up new communities. They were keeping ties to their, uh, their German culture, German language. Uh, but while also sort of being integrated into the state of Argentina. And uh, Argentina at that time was extremely, extremely economically prosperous. So. They were living a pretty good life. And I think it's one of the reasons why you still see such a large uh, you know, population of descendants of German people because originally they were keeping their, um, you know, their German culture, keeping the language, because there was a chance that they might you know, end up moving back, moving back to Europe, moving back to Germany and resettling there. And they didn't want the, you know, their families, their kids to be at a disadvantage if they had, uh, you know, didn't learn, you know, lost the German language, lost the German culture and such. But, uh, yeah, the Volga Germans, I think they made, the ones who decided to come here to Argentina definitely made the right decision. I think that's, that's pretty obvious. And the interwar period between World War I and World War II, there was still German immigration to Argentina. And uh, largely in the first part of that period, because... Uh, <laughs> Germany was not doing great economically um, for for part of that time, and a lot of uh, a lot of people fled for economic reasons. But later, from 1933 on, uh, there were a lot of people, specifically German uh, Jews and opponents of uh, Hitler's Nazi regime, Nazi regime, who uh, were fleeing specifically because they were being persecuted or because they opposed. Um, you know, the Nazi regime in Germany and wanted to leave. So that's where you get a very large population of German Jews immigrating to Argentina. 
We talked about Jewish immigration to Argentina in that previous video where we visited uh, Templo Libertad. Put a, put a link to that down in the description. You can check it out. But that period lasted, of course, up until World War II. And then during World War II, you have very limited immigration at that time. But that is the time when our sailors from the Admiral Graf Spee settled here in Argentina. So there was that. But um, once the war was over, in the uh, early part of the, or the late part of the 40s and the early part of the 50s, there was still German immigration. Um, Juan Perón uh, did, controversially, open the doors to a lot of former Nazis. Now that's not to say that all the Germans who immigrated during that time were Nazis. In fact, it's probably a very, very small percentage of them that were. But it should be mentioned that during that time, from you know 1946 until 55, when uh, when Juan Perón was overthrown by the Liberating Revolution, that he did open up the doors, not just open the doors to uh, to Nazis, but you know he uh, set up a whole immigration pipeline, and there were several infamous Nazi war criminals who uh, settled here in Argentina after World War II. So that's basically it for historical German immigration. I mean, of course, you know, there's been immigration since Juan Perón in the 50s, but uh, no, no major waves of immigration like there were before. And today, Argentina has relatively good um, diplomatic and economic relations with um, with uh, Germany. Germany is a large import partner of Argentina and uh, like I said diplomatic relations are more or less stable. There's a couple of interesting things of note or at least interesting to me. One is the German beer brand Kilmes which I have referred to in previous videos as like the beer of the people. Um, that's an Argentine beer brand, and uh, it was started by uh, a German guy. He founded the company, and Kielmace, of course, is kind of a German-sounding name. And interestingly, the brewery for Kielmace is in the town of Kielmace, which is right next door to Wilde, where we were staying in Buenos Aires province. It's like one train stop away. Didn't actually get a chance to go there, but uh, the brewery, Kilmes is there. Now, of course, <laughs> Kilmes is not, no longer really Kilmes. It's just a brand. It's not its own company anymore. Got uh, like pretty much everything else nowadays. It got, out, got bought out by a giant multinational conglomerate called uh, Ambev, I think. I don't know. It's this huge Brazilian conglomerate that owns like a million different drink brands. So, um, you know, like everything else in your life, your entire life is basically owned by like, I don't know, 15 or 20 different massive conglomerates. But still, Kilmes was started by a German guy right here in Argentina. The beer of the people. I call it that because like, I see a lot of people drinking it here. It's available widely, like all over the place here. And uh, it's pretty cheap and I don't really, I've never really seen it like outside of Argentina. So, and I feel like it's a, it's like a cultural thing in Argentina, you know? Like the Boca Juniors, they had it on their, uh, on their uh, jersey as a sponsor for a few years. So, Gilmes, the beer of the people of Argentina, is actually German. So I guess that's actually it for the uh, history of Germany, German immigration. Argentina. So I think now it's finally time to finish our mission and go check out that museum. I'll see you when we get there. All right, we're here and look, the doors are open. The museum's open. We were right. It's actually open. Okay, we're going to go in. We're going to pay because it does cost a little bit. And then we're going to see what's in here. Okay, so we got inside and we paid our entrance fee. And uh, it's a pretty cool museum. 
It is kind of small, but I mean, it's really packed with stuff. There's a really nice lady here who was telling me exactly where everything is. She told me in Spanish. I understood about 50% of it, which is par for the course. And then I told her that I already kind of knew the story of the Graf Spi. And she said, oh, I have a little book about the story of the Graf Spi. And she gave me this. I don't think I can keep this. I think this is just a, like, show. And so I looked at it and I said, wow, that's cool. And then I thought, you know what? This is going to be all in Spanish and I'm not going to understand any of it. And lo and behold, when you open it up, it's in... German. So I'm really not going to understand any of this, um, but it is interesting. And I imagine it tells like the whole story of the Graf Spee uh, in, in German. So cool, very cool. There's a picture of it on the front. So you can at least get a look at what it looked like. But uh, yeah, it's in German. So it's going to do us absolutely no good. Looks like there's some uh, primeros pobladores. So these are the original. This is like original, old, old stuff. This is way, way old. So the, the German settlers that I mentioned, you know, they really only showed up here in the 30s. And of course, it looks like before there were indigenous here. Comechingones. See right there, Comechingones. That's the, that's the tribe that, like the native tribe that was here before, um, before anyone else came and settled. And they were actually... Uh, like all around this area before the Spanish came and settled in 1573 like we remember from the video about uh, uh, Jeronimo Luis de Cabrera um, that was the that, that was the name of the native people that were here but here we go this is like in the 30s so yeah so these these this guy bought like 300, or no, sold 300 hectares to Jorge Capun. This, this is what I remember reading, is that like in the early 30s, 30, 1930, there were like just a few, very few, one, two or three families who came here and, uh, and like, um, it's like built homes here and settled here. And then, you know, later, the Graf Spee, that was in, like, 1939, the battle, and they settled, the sailors settled here in the 40s. So, it was apparently a very small settlement, and it looks like it, from these pictures, it looks like it was real small, just a few houses. And, uh, and then later, of course, the Graf Spee, when they came, there was, like, 130 sailors who came and settled here, so that must have been quite the influx of population. But you can see here in all of these older pictures, 1932, 1935, just very, very small settlement, just a few maybe farms, ranches, people here. here I guess these are yeah these are the two founders and this is the guy we, we just saw so the the land that was sold to him Jorge Capun Capun and Paul Friedrich Heinze those are like the two co-founders of Villa General Belgrano and these I guess are their pants it's one of them I don't know if this is actually this person's pants. It might be like a recreation of their pants, but looks like their pants. And a bombacha, which I guess is like a sling you spin around and then throw and, I don't know, trap something with.
animal of some sort. Here's the first, first school. 1937, they made a school. And those are the first, the first children at the school. Oh, and there's a painting, a painting of the first, of the children at the school. Now this, hmm, this is an Argentine, this is not a German uh, uniform, this is an Argentine uniform. Who is this? Oh, uh, I guess it was donated, I guess it was this guy. Whoever this is, Traje Suit, Jorge Schuler. Okay. Oh, Jefe de Bombero. So this is the chief, chief of the fire department. And this is his, uh, this is his fire department uniform. Bomberos is uh, our firefighters. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's a hat. That's like a firefighter's hat. Very cool. Central Telefonica Que Data de 1968. This is the first telephone system it looks like for the for the villa for the whole town. Very cool, look at this. And let's see, there's more stuff here in the center. Oh, there's a chorus, the chorus of Visha Herrero del Grado. 1952. Yeah, I guess this, these are just like old, old photos of the people who lived here in different years. You can see, still very, very German, celebrating very, uh, very uh, German, German festivals and dressed very, very German. A visit of Governor Justo Paez Molina. Inauguration of the first post office. Oh, and this is okay. So this is the how the education has developed here from like way, way back, 1937, all the way up through like the 60s. The presence of religion. So it looks like there is there is definitely a uh, a chapel real real close by actually it's like kind of like right outside right around the corner here I've seen a big tower with a cross on it Aquí me quedo which means here here I stay. Then over here. Oh yeah, so this is from the chapel of uh, Our Lady of the Valley. Which maybe that's the name of the of the church that's like right here. That would make sense. an electric organ, no pipes, I don't see any pipes attached to it. <laughs> and uh, old record player. Oh. 
an old record player here. So a lot of this stuff I think is just donated by like families, people who who were here. Oh, there's a cool painting up here. See that? I guess that, that looks like a painting of this building, actually. So I guess maybe this wasn't always a wasn't always a museum. Maybe this was I don't know what this was before. But uh it's pretty cool. Okay, so here is the stuff about the Grafspi, and here is a model of the Grafspi. And so what we mentioned before, the Grafspi was like bigger, faster, had bigger guns. These are the guns we were talking about. They had these big 11-inch guns in these big triple turrets. And uh, the other ships that it was up against, the Exeter, the Achilles, the, uh, what was the other one? I think it was the Ajax. Either way, they all they all had smaller guns, eight-inch guns, and that's basically like this guy right here on the side, this little guy. So those were like the biggest guns that uh, that those other three ships, the British ships, had. So this thing could outrange them by you know many, many, many meters. Here it looks like a a uniform. Yeah, from the Admiral Graf Spee. This, I guess, is a picture of someone, someone who was on, one of the sailors who was on the Graf Spee, looks like. And uh, maybe two sailors there in the picture, dedicating the uh, a plaque. I guess, I think that's the plaque that's outside, actually, on, on the, on the, uh... oh, and here, this is the Achilles. So this is the other, this is the British ship, was the Achilles. I wonder if they have, like, some stuff from the, uh, from the Achilles as well. That's interesting. This is a replica of the, like, the shield of the Grafspee. uniform from the Graf Spee. Some parts, I guess these are, yeah, these are, these are parts of the actual Graf Spee, it looks like. That's pretty cool. And this is a smaller, smaller model, but of the same, the Graf Spee, with the same shield, same shield. Looks like a, a book about the Graf Spee. And some pictures. Pictures of the Graf Spee. And down on the bottom, it looks like these are more, more actual parts of the Graf Spee. The rest of it, the rest of the Graf Spee is still in the, the estuary. It's in, it's like a, it's floating out there. I guess they, they tried to raise it and they maybe like took some parts off of it, but looks like this is the Graf Spee with, with the damage. Once it was damaged and its, uh, its fuel system was damaged. Either that or this is, this might be after they s decided to scuttle it. Yeah, no, you know what? This looks like because once it was damaged and the fuel system was damaged, it was still able to sail all the way into Montevideo, into the port. So this must be after they scuttled it, and like as it was sinking. That's pretty wild. And that, I think, right there is Hans Langsdorf. The, uh, the cat, the, yeah, I think that's his signature right there, right? Hans Langsdorf? I think that's the, the captain who, uh, who captained the ship. So that's the stuff. I think this is just this corner here is the stuff dedicated to the Graf Spee. 
Oh, no, wait. There's some more stuff here. These are some people, like some sailors insignia here. Oh, this is a, this is a map. So this is the root of the Graf Spee. And like I was saying before, it started, you know, all the way up here in Germany, came down to the Atlantic, it was in the Atlantic when the war started, sank a bunch of merchant ships around here in the Atlantic, sailed over around Africa, sank a, more merchant ships in the Indian Ocean, then sailed back over and ended up over here, right off the coast, Buenos Aires. And that's where it fought, yeah, the Achilles, the Ajax, and the Exeter. And then the Cumberland, that was a heavy cruiser that showed up afterwards. Once it had already made port in, uh, in Montevideo, the Cumberland showed up. And the three ships, the Ajax, the uh, Achilles, and the Cumberland, sort of sat offshore, um, running their engines, putting a lot of smoke up into the air to... Their, their goal was to try and convince, uh, you know, along with the, like, fake radio uh, and telegram and, I think, tele telegram messages? I don't know, fake, basically fake messages to uh, the Grafsby that there was a big um, reinforcement force coming. And it worked, because uh, it convinced them to scuttle the ship. Although they probably, they were probably not going to be able to make it out of Montevideo anyway. This is the, after the construction of the camp where the Graf Spee sailors settled, and that, that's them posing out in front, or some of them at least. I want to say some of them, because I think it was 130 that settled here, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that number. And then over here, yeah, here's some more. These looks like, these is news newspaper clippings about the Graf Spee and about the uh, the different battles, I guess. Yeah, here's the this is the explosion. This is a photo of the explosion, I guess, when they when they scuttled the ship. And here it is, sinking, after they scuttled it. This is, uh, looks like rescue operations bringing the, uh, the sailors off of the ship into the port of Buenos Aires. La Agonia del Spi. Yeah, story, story about the Graf Spi. I mean, this must have been huge news at the time. Can you imagine? World War II just kicked off. And, you know, like a couple months later, there's a huge naval battle right off the coast. You know, Montevideo off the coast of Argentina. If you're living in, like, Mar del Plata or Buenos Aires or Montevideo, this would have been all over the news. This would have been huge news. There's the Ajax. So this is this is the cruiser. This is one of the what the light cruiser Ajax, right? This is what it looked like. And then this is the Exeter, the heavy cruiser that the British had. And you can see, I mean, it's it's big, but you can see these smokestacks in the middle, right? Those are for for, for like coal burning. It's a steamship burning coal, and it looks kind of old too, both of these. You can tell they look kind of old, right, compared to this bad boy, the Grafsby. I mean, look at this thing. Look at that thing compared to those. Definitely more technologically advanced, definitely newer. But, like we said before, you know, they built a technologically advanced ship, and, uh, didn't really help them because they didn't have a, they couldn't build enough of them. They only built three. It's the original telephone system that we filmed before. It still works. And this nice lady is going to show us how it works. Now it's going to be in Spanish, of course, so like I'm not going to understand very much, but here, let's take a look. 
So when Oh yeah, so like as she dials, it still it still functions. You can see all the switches moving. It was really amazing. Wow. Teníamos en los años 40 este sistema que es con las clavijas, el conmutador y este en 1968 oh. llega esta para 100 usuarios electromecánica y funciona por pulsos que emite el aparato, los lee y comunica. Ah, muy bien, muy interesante. Y ahí ya comunica. Oh, muy genial. Y bueno, alemán, Siemens. Este, Argentina tuvo siempre Siemens en lo que es telecomunicación. Sí, sí. Eh, ahora, bueno, ya cambió porque se privatizó, pero siempre fue Siemens. Muy, muy interesante. <risa> Muchísimas gracias. Por favor. Muchísimas gracias. Que tengas un buen día. So that was super interesting. There's a lot of there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. I mean, those news articles. I, I didn't really think about it before, but like the 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 news articles, like it, it must have been a huge, huge story, right? In Montevideo, in the newspapers, in Buenos Aires, and like I, I do remember reading when we learned about this that like there were people like who. Uh, you know, were, were 24, 24-7 intelligence agents from the British that were in Montevideo, that were in Buenos Aires, and their job was just to like keep an eye on the uh, Graf Spi and make sure it's still in port there. So pretty amazing they got all that there. And uh, I'm really glad we got in to see this. And uh, I think that's gonna be it. I think it's gonna be it for the video. We had a good time, talked about the, the bigger, larger history of German immigration and uh, I feel like this is a good conclusion to our little journey, our two-part journey out here to uh, to uh, Visha General Belgrano, and um, uh, we do have a little time before the bus leaves, so uh, I think I might uh, go down into the uh, into the center of town and uh, get myself a beer or something. But I think we're good. I think we had a good good conclusion, and I think we've we finally told the whole story here. And it took us two part two videos to do it. But uh, I think it's a good story and it's worth telling. So we'll see you in the next video.